Hello and welcome to my channel, I am Zodiac Bandit, and today we're going to be recapping episode 102 of Campaign 3 of Critical Role. This was super fun, it's nice to be back with the main cast, so let's get into it. We start in Aeor, the Bell's Hells have just come to after seeing the Vision of Downfall. They are standing in the room of the Occultist Thalamus, and they all take a breath as they come back to their bodies. Ludinus stands before them smiling. He says the Thalamus has now shown them... Uh, the true face of the gods, and the face that he's always known. The gods have a narcissistic fantasy, and they hand out guesses and punishments, harvesting faith through reverence and fear, all to redirect the soul to their realms to feed on. They now know what he knows is true. The immortals of Exandria are the seeds to their eternal garden of exploitation, locked in a cycle of their making against the natural order. The primordials were here before the gods, and they themselves will be here long after the gods are gone. The mortals were once part of them, were once part of the primordials, but they were pulled away and reshaped to be used, but the gods didn't account for the strength of their spirit. The desire to learn and grow, to make, unmake, and make again, to challenge the mysteries of the universe with their brief lives. They made something more perfect than themselves. They made people. The Age of Arcanum, uh, where their enlightenment was a revolution, philosophy art and the promise of understanding was their purpose it was the gods meddling that brought that to ruin it was their right to inherit the future but the gods wouldn't move aside imogen then cuts them off and asks if they were watching the same orb luna says it'll take some time for them to understand what they saw and then asks what she saw imogen says that they saw some uncertainty and they saw the fact that the gods were flawed and changeable just like the rest of them Luna says that she's not wrong, but they don't lord over themselves uh, and others, and then wipe them out with a second thought. Orem says that Ludinus knows that's not true at all. Lana says that it's ironic coming from someone who's caused a bunch of destruction with murderous intent. Ludinus says there's been an unfortunate uh, amount of necessities on this path, but uh, don't think that there weren't points where a choice was given. If they knew the absolute cruelty and ignorance of those in power... Uh, in this world throughout history, they would have understood the righteous minds. Uh, they would understand that the righteous minds have to do what is necessary for all good. Imogen laughs and says uh, he's no different uh, than what he's fighting. And Lana asks uh, what his plans are after uh, he unmakes everything. Lunas says that he's watched kingdoms rise and fall and fools have been crowned. But those are our mistakes to make. For them to learn and to live and to die and to teach. Ashton tries to say something, but Ludinus cuts him off and says that he's talking still. Ashton says to be careful, he's the one here who agrees with him the most. Ludinus continues and says that they've, they've all lived under their shackled intent, being told that they are everything, and they will guide the people. They just need their prayer in return. But they've killed endless lives. They've burned the land multiple times and wiped it from history when it was convenient. And when they couldn't uh, change the history, they changed the, to the tombs a bit. Luna says he doesn't see himself as better than them, but he doesn't hold the same amount of power they do. When the gods are gone, they will inherit the world and it will finally be theirs. Orm speaks up and he says he wants to change the subject and claims to be the person who agrees with him the least. He asks what it means to release a god eater. He might unleash hell upon the world as well. Luna says next time they step on Ruidus, he should speak uh, with it. A word with Pradathos. It will become clear then. Fern asks how he knows Pradathos will stop with the gods. He says their souls are of Exandria unlike the gods and itself. It wants to stay within its circle. People are outside of its circle. Imogen says that they made us as well. They are part of the gods. She thinks Pradathos will eat the gods and lick up the crumbs left behind. Luna says the shark doesn't bother itself with the krill, but Chetney speaks up and says the blue whale does. Imogen says that Luna speaks of talking with Pradathos, but he is not part of it. He wants to be a part of it, though, doesn't he? He can commune with it all he wants, but he will never feel the same thing that she feels. Ludinus smiles and says he wants to free them all from those who would hold them down. Ashton asks if he would die for it, and Ludinus says that he would. Fern asks why he hates the gods so much, and he says that these myths and visions are what he grew up with. He lived a human lifetime in the world they burned. And he watched those who remain 
say to him to stay faithful because they will love you and guide you. Some societies rebuilt in their honor and they waged war in their name even without their feet on the soil. Their presence throughout history has led to ruin and everything that's beautiful is from people, from mortals. He's tired of living under the illusion that they are better for it. Ashton says that he's mad because that they are all betrayer gods. Brea says not all of them, and Imogen agrees she saw what the Everlight did. Ashton asks what he thinks is uh, what they think is going to happen when they leave here after learning what they've now l- learned. He says that they are a threat and a leak uh, to the truth, and he thinks that when they step out of here, the gods will have to, uh, will have a hint of that, and will likely cut them down, including the Everlight. In Ashton's eyes, they are all betrayer gods. When everyone has seen what they have seen, they will all be able to make their own choices. Lana says that that will lead to war and discourse. She is confused by his position. He acts like he hates war over the gods, but he's about to go to war over them himself. Orm says the gods have uh, been gone for centuries and will be back instantly if others see what they have seen. Many more will die. He sounds just like Father Milo, so wrong and vain. Brea says Father Milo only spoke the truth and the others disagreed. Brea says his goal was clear, he wanted his family back and he wanted his power. But the others said no and they wanted to take out a city. Brea says Ludinus has only given them two choices, the prime deities and the people. But there's a third option, the betrayers. Ludinus says that some of the betrayers hate them more than any other. Brea isn't worried about the gods smiting them for learning this. He says he's already known this for years, the prime deities are assholes. They betrayed him before and he's found someone who won't. He claims he and Cassadia are the same. Ludinus says uh, they just saw the gods' darkest hour, and Ashen's first thought is that they'd smite them all down for learning it. Does that not give them pause for who they are? Ashen says that it just confirms his thought, and this changes nothing in his life. Chetney wants to ask some personal questions. Chetney says that Ludinus is a hard person to reach. He had to turn into a werewolf to get close to him physically, but he got impaled for his efforts, so fuck you, Ludinus. Ludinus says that he got carried away back then. Lana says that he destroyed their skyship, but Ludinus actually says correctly that they actually threw it at him. But then Orm cuts them all off and says that he called a hit on his family and succeeded. So again, fuck you, Ludinus. Brace agrees with that. Chetney then asks his question. How have you been alive for so long? And asks if he's mortal. Ludinus says that he's been able to stretch uh, the end years of his life for this purpose. Ashton asks where Ludinus was during downfall. And Luna says that he was a child and watched the streak of the burning city through the sky and he grew up in the smoke of it. Lana says that she saw a weird, fucked up family like themselves and she'd do anything for any one of them, at the expense of others. They've all killed for each other. Ashton says that's why they are just like them, which is why there should be nothing like that that exists. It's not about whose throne it is, but about the throne in general. Chenny then asks what happened to Malayas Mir. Ludinus says that it was his first uh, communion and it was his first attempt to make a connection. Fern asks why he chose to show them the vision and he says that they are, like many others, bright and strong and open to the truth. Uh, they fight for those around them and that is the, the spirited mortal life in which he fights to preserve. He doesn't want the gods to be considered garbage. They are like them, but with every step they destroy eras and no one should have that much power. Orm says that everything he's saying about the gods can be said about mortals, so why is he stopping at the gods if that's his logic? Orm asks if it's just jealousy. Ludinus says that he has a uniquely unfocused conviction and it's admirable. He says that he's sorry for what happened to his family and he blames Otohan for being overzealous, uh, but she got what she was, or she got what was coming to her in the end. Imogen says that he sent her after them and Ashton says that not all of them got away from that. Ludinus owns his place in that but unfortunately what needs to be done is larger than other things orum says the the ends justify the means right chenny asks if ludinus has tried to rebuild the Ma- uh, factor malleus before the god hammer he says the knowledge has been lost and even with the hopes of uncovering it they lack the ability to make it Bray says that he didn't come here looking for stories he was looking for something ludinus says that not initially uh he was looking for uh, stories but once he found the orb that changed everything ashton says that he agrees with a lot of this but the only way he thinks it can end is with him dying as well ludinus says if he doesn't survive this but succeeds his soul will lie happy orm rolls an inside check and gets a 17 and gets a whisper 
Ludinus says a weapon would be useful, but they don't have time to make it, and so many things can go wrong. Information can travel in an instant. If you feed, if a god is fed on faith, what happens when you shake it all at once? Brea says that he's not a friend uh, to the others, but he's only shown one story to them, and there are many. Who's to say there aren't stories that contradict them? Ludinus says that they know the truth, and now he hopes that they can see uh, who he is a little bit and why he gives uh, himself to his cause. Alana says that she's thankful to be able to see it, but as they saw, not all gods agreed with uh, with what they were doing, and not all of them agree here. They want to find other solutions to this problem, and she feels like they are owed a chance to that. Ludna says that he's lived nearly a thousand years, thinking of every possibility, and he has failed at many of them. He spent lifetimes weaving this thread uh, to let this singular moment in history be possible. If they want to find another way, their time is running out, and they've uh, and they the Ruby Vanguard, have been going for a while. He asked them to join him and to shepherd in their new future to hope they to free their people from the divine uh, penance. At this moment, Tavon says, this only furthers the need for punishment for all of them. His lord demands vengeance. He draws his blade and then runs toward Ludinus. However, Ludinus banishes him in an instant. Imogen says that not everyone agrees with Ludinus and some people want the gods. What gives him the right to make this choice? Dorian says he just wants the power to be on equal grounds and stand with the gods, right? And Luna says that he has had the opportunity to pull the strings behind the thrones for some time now, but only has done so toward these ends. He doesn't want to control, he just wants them gone. Imogen says that's what you want. Chetney says the Malayas Mirror was a whole city that got smoked by a failure, which it seems that he has learned from seeing as how the bloody bridge has been made. He asks what if Ludinus is wrong and Pradothos eats everyone else. Uh, is it better to be beneath the gods or to be eaten and destroyed? Ludinus says that he wishes they knew what he knew. And Imogen says for him to tell them then. The others want him to answer Chetney's question. And Fern says that he's killed their family and now he asks them to join him. Orm says like a god. Ludinus says it's not just uh, him. He's with many others. One of them being Imogen's mother. Ludinus says that Imogen holds the strong potential in her red light and hopes that she lives up to her potential. Ludinus says that he sidestepped the question, is destruction better than being under the gods? Ludinus says no, it won't happen. Ludinus says that he understands what he is capable of, he being Pradathos. And he's been around many and through them he knows Pradathos wants out and he wants them, the gods. Imogen says that he wants out and it's so hungry. She felt that. She felt welcomed by it. It was hard to get free and she can't believe it won't want to do that to everything it comes near. Luna says the Malayas Mirror was a failure but it was also a success. It was the first time they saw each other. Fern asks what he saw and he says that he saw a lost entity sealed away to fade in its shadow. And Fern says that it's a good idea to release that then. Ashton asks if the gods know what it is and Luna says this is not the first time they've encountered it. Im uh, Imogen says that's why it's in the moon, because of the gods. And Chetney asks if Ludinus knows who the lost gods are. Ludinus says yes, and the party asks him to tell them. He looks to Fern and says that she who is born uh, in the Fae Convergence is now bound to the devils and the prim uh, primordials. She's a nexus of the realm. Lana asks if he's going to tell them all of their great potential in a circle. Uh, just, a, just a weird circle jerk from Ludinus. Ludinus says that Ladna has a familiar air about her, and says that Delilah is ever tenacious. She could have been bright had she not been lost through the selfish interest and the bark of faith. He asks that Delilah is clinging on to this world very hungrily. Ladna feels something inside of her begin to boil. Ludinus says that he can free her and give them both a second chance at life, and uh, give Delilah a chance to change history. Lana says, all right, she wants to know how he'll do it, and Ludinus says to join him. Chetney does an inside check and gets a 21 and gets a whisper. Ludinus says this was enlightening. Chetney has one more question. What else has to be done, and why hasn't he released Pradathos yet? Ludinus says that he's been forthright, but they are conflicted, and that's understandable. Which is completely ignoring the fucking question, by the way. <laughs> Fern says, of course they are. He killed their family. Ladna says that he needs Imogen, that's why nothing's happened yet. Ludinus pulls out a gem and plays with it for a minute, and it pulses with magic. 
He says he believes they can still work together, but uh, he has contingency plans that require him, not them. Soon the world will see what they've seen. Ashen asks what he'll do when he sees a large number of people don't love him after they he, they see the truth. Luna sa says he doesn't care if he is loved or not. Ashen doesn't believe him. He says that he believes that Luna believes that, but he doesn't believe him. Lana tries to figure out uh, what the gem is, but she rolls low on Arcana. It looks like glass that is surrounding Pradathos. Uh, Fern tries to sleight of hand it out of his hands, with, uh, but at disadvantage. She rolls an 18. He's looking at the stone and sees her come near. He tilts his head over at her. She asks what it is and he says that it's not for her. He looks to Ladna and says Delilah was a crafty one and throws it over to her. And says it's a means to take what she seeks. And says to find him when she's free of them. Chetney tries to grab it out of the air instead of Ladna. And with a higher dex save, Chetney does in fact grab it. Fury rises within Ladna and she out of control grabs Chetney's arm. Lana uses Hunger of the Shadow, and Chetney tries to put the gem away into the Bag of Holding, and succeeds. Uh, Lana attacks Chetney, and hits for 14 damage. Chetney throws the Bag of Holding towards Dorian. Lana tries to stop herself. Ludna says it looks like they have enough to deal with right now, and says to Delilah, there's a lot in these ruins that she can use. Fern tries to stealth over to uh, Ludinus with a 16, uh, Ladna is now flaring purple energy. Ludna sees Fern coming and then suddenly vanishes. Imogen uses the tech uh, thoughts to try to see if he's still around them. She doesn't feel any of his thoughts, but they can all suddenly hear the door of the chamber close shut. Uh, he is haunted by Ladna's spirit, however, from the previous time they all fought, and she can feel him behind the door. As she's looking into the darkness trying to feel him out, she hears, I've waited too long to have this be this close and to have it taken away. Lana says that she didn't do anything. What is she doing? Lana is holding on to Ashton. Imogen looks into Lana's eyes and see the spark of liveliness beginning to recede. Purple then flares and shoots up. Wisdom saved from Lana and she rolls an 18. Lana buckles down. Ashton uh, goes to lift her head and there's suddenly an explosion of dark energy. Body parts of Lana are beginning to twist and contort and her eyes are now purple burning sockets. The shadow around her forms into Delilah, and it's time to roll initiative, and a map comes out. Initiative rolls. Ashton with a 23, Orm with a 22, Dorian with a 22, but Orm rolled higher on the rollies. Fern with a 17, Imogen with a 16, uh, I think Braeus was around 4, Chetney was 4, and Ladna was 4. They do rollies, so Braeus won, Chetney was then the next highest, and Ladna was the last one. Ashton is up, he rages and attacks trying to knock Ladna out. He hits with one of his attacks dealing 22 damage. Delilah uses a legendary action to attack Ashen and hits dealing 24 damage. Ashen uses erratic defense to take half the damage and uh, Delilah heals for 6 HP because she only did 12 damage. Orem is up. He moves up to Ladna. He attacks and misses 3 times as she casts shield. He's shaken in this moment. He throws seedling to the ground and a shield to the ground hoping that Ladna will see him through the shadow. He uses second wind to heal a bit. Delilah uses another legendary action and attacks Ashen again. He hits for, or she hits for 25 damage, uh, Delilah healing for half of that. Dorian is up. He casts invisibility on himself using his mandolin, and then he moves away and hides the bag in some of the dirt off in the corner. He then moves back away from it and then drops his invisibility. He then gives Ladna a bardic inspiration. Fern is up and she casts Aura of Life, giving those within 30 feet resistance to necrotic damage, and when they start at the next turn, they heal for hit one hit point. Or if they go down. Fern rolls for a wild magic d20, and she rolls an 8, so nothing happens. They need a 17 for some weird shit to happen. Fern says, uh, Delilah, you're not getting out of this unless uh, we help her, so stop or we'll have to kill you. Imogen says she'd do anything to free Ladna of Delilah. Delilah says that she's been patient, but they've taken too long. Imogen is up and she casts Calm Emotions. Uh, she has to roll a d20 because she casts at a third level because she's out of anything lower than that. Delilah saves on the Calm Emotions. Nothing happens about the magic or the wild magic table. Imogen then backs away. Delilah uses another legendary action, 
to shadow step away and towards the door. Essek is now up. He casts hold monsters, but Delilah save. Saves. <laughs> he casts hold monster, and Delilah saves. I missed the place the S somehow. Uh, he doesn't want to hurt Lana, but will if they need to. Brace is up. He moves up and casts Sacred Flame on Delilah. She fails and takes 11 damage. Brayus then inspires Dorian, and Chetney is up. He clicks his boots of speed and looks over at the sphere as he runs towards it. Uh, the sphere where the magic orb came from. Orb came from. He sees uh, it is a very advanced piece of technology that has a bunch of cables running to it and is now powerless. He then takes out his new harp and casts magic missile at Delilah, hitting for 11 damage. Of course it hits, it's magic missile. Ladna is up, wisdom saves, she rolls a 23 and saves, and she gets to go. She looks up Delilah and says, uh, please, we both want peace, work with me, or it's time to go. She uses wrestle with, or from within, to give all attacks on Delilah advantage till her next turn. Her being Ladna's next turn. Ladna then quicken spells and casts Phantasma Force, and makes an image of Silas. Unfortunately, Delilah saves. She yells, how dare you mock him and me, and then Ladna forcibly moves Delilah back towards the others and yells, kill her. Delilah then is up and she casts a Blade of Disaster, and a black blade comes forth from the ground and begins to hover in the air. It's fucking Craven Edge, which is badass as shit. Also, Craven Edge gets a fucking cameo in Campaign 3 before Grog does. It me uh, <laughs> it then swings for Orum and hits for forty four fucking damage, and Orum goes down. Bonus action: she summons undead and specters. Great, more shit. The undead are now up, and the first uh, begins to hit for, or begins to swing for Fern and hits for three damage. The second one hits for eight damage. Brace is attacked, but both miss, and two specters begin to attack Essek, but they both miss as well. There are three skeletons and two specters, just to clear that up. Ashen is now up, back at the top of the turn order. He moves up to Delilah and swings and hits for 20, uh, 21 damage. He swings again and crits for 44 damage. Delilah then uh, uses a legendary action and hits Ashen again for 11 damage, healing for half of that. So, I think most DMs would round up, so it would be 6 HP going back towards Delilah. Orm is up. He gets healed by Aura of Life. He has one hit point. He stands and grabs uh, his stuff. And he casts Hex on Lana and gives her disadvantage on intelligence checks. He swings for Delilah and hits with a goading attack for 18 damage. However, uh, Delilah saves the goad. He swings again and hits for 15 more damage and then hits again for 16 more damage. He then action surges and tries to hit Craven Edge but swings right through it. And then he goes back to hitting Delilah for 11 and 9 more damage respectively. Legendary action from Delilah and hits Orm, downing Orm once again, healing for 8 damage on the attack. Dorian is up. He watches Orm fall again. He runs over to Orm and casts Cure Wounds, healing for 20 hit points. He then picks Orm up. Delilah then shadow steps away from the group again, closer to Chetney. Fern is up. She casts Flame Strike on Delilah, who saves, but one of the Spectres fail. That's right near Delilah in this moment. Uh, she deals 8 fire damage and 8 radiant damage. Delilah smiles and looks back at Fern. Fern then moves up and the undead swing for her as she left its range. Uh, and they nearly hit but she cast shield on herself. So they both in fact miss. Imogen is up and she activates her robe. Giving her spells more damage or giving her spell attacks uh, and a, her DC plus 2. Imogen then twin spells catapult on two stone pillars and throws them both at Delilah. Both hit for 45 damage on the first one and 32 damage on the second one. Delilah then shifts her attention to Chetney, who yells for Essek to please help as it's now Essek's turn. He glides over towards Chetney and he gets hit by a specter as he leaves the range for 13 damage. Essek casts haste on Chetney. He then rolls a 17 on the wild magic table and Essek is suddenly turned into a goat. The goat is floating by the way. Brayus is up, he misty steps towards Delilah and then walks up for the rest of the, the movement he has and then swings for Delilah and crits for 35 damage. He swings again and hits with a Divine Smite for 37 damage. Someone needs to tell Sam that he can Divine Smite after he attacks. 
I, like, I, I just feel like no one told him that. So, like, he can crit and then be like, oh, I'm going to pump a Divine Smite on that and crit the Divine Smite. It's something you can do after the fact. So, someone needs to tell him that. I just think that that's something I need to point out. Uh, Chetney is now up. He takes out his chisel and makes, or he ignites his ice right. And then he swings for Delilah and hits two times for 20 damage on both attacks. So 40 damage total. He then attacks one more time for 20 more damage. Chenny did 60 damage total in this round. The ice damage, however, wasn't totally effective. So it's not quite 20 damage. Or sorry, it's not quite 60 damage. He then runs out of the range of Delilah, who swings for him and hits for 31 damage. Ladna is up. Wisdom save of 22. Ladna can have a turn. She casts Animate Object as a Quicken spell on one of the mage statues in the room. Uh, she then uses Wrestle from Within to give everyone advantage again. She then moves towards Ashton. The statue is up and it moves towards Delilah and smashes Delilah, hitting for 11 damage. Uh, Delilah is up and she moves Craven Edge over to Ashton and crits on the swing, dealing 103 fucking damage. Ashton begins to fall, but with Relentless Rage, he only goes down to one hit point. Craven Edge then hits Fern for 33 damage, and Fern lo loses concentration on Aura of Life. Delilah then casts, because that was all a bonus action, by the way, 103 damage on a bonus action. Crit, of course. But Delilah then casts Horde Wilting, hitting everyone except Chetney, as Skeleton Hands burst from the ground, hitting those within the range. Con saves all around. Those who fail take 54, uh, 54 damage, and those who save take 27. Dorian fails, Breus fails, Imogen fails, Ashen fails, uh, but with Relentless Rage, he's able to stay up. Fern saves and takes 27 damage. Orum saves, but goes down anyway because he didn't have that much HP to begin with. And Essek is no longer a sheep because he loses that form. The Undead are now up. They rush in. Four attack Dorian. One misses. One hits for 10 damage. And the others miss. Fern gets uh, hit for one damage. Ashen is up. Uh, still barely uh, holding on. He walks up to Delilah and transforms into his elemental form. As he does so. And he currently takes his diamond form. Not quite sure what the difference is there. But I'm kind of interested in that. And that ends his turn. Orm is up. Death save. And he fails. Dorian is up. He grabs onto Orm and casts Dimension Door and gets as far away as possible, putting him on top of a large pillar. And then he flies back down towards the rest, landing behind Breus. Delilah then shadow steps again. Fern is up and she casts Flame Strike again. She deals 20 damage total to Delilah and the skeletons. Imogen is up. She lines herself up to hit Craven Edge, Delilah, and a skeleton with a lightning bolt. However, Delilah uses Counter Spell and she gets a natural 20 on the counter. But then Matt rolls another natural 20 on the Wild Magic. So now Marisha has to roll on the Wild Magic table. And she rolls a 97. Which maximizes the damage of the next spell they cast. Meaning Delilah or Ladna. Hopefully Ladna goes first. Imogen then quicken spells and casts uh, Mind Sliver on Delilah. But Delilah saves. Imogen then moves out of a straight line of Delilah. Uh, Essek is up. He says that he's been saving this uh, if they need to get away, but maybe now is the time to use it. He floats back and casts Reality Break. However, Delilah fails, but she uses a Legendary Resistance to save, so nothing happens. Weird turn, Matthew Mercer. Weird turn. Breus then Misty steps again and then runs up and swings for Delilah. Uh, he becomes a bit more bull-like as he gets angry in this fight. He hits for 48 more damage. On the first strike, and then he hits again with a Divine Smite for 29 more damage. He swings, and Black Icker begins to come off the shadowy form as he swings, and it paints the wall and, and becomes the symbol of Asmodeus, defeating Delilah as he does so. Ladna falls back. There's a scream, and the shadows go back into her body. The dead, the undead all fall, and Craven Edge is now gone. Fern casts Master Your Wounds, healing Ladna and Ashen. Orum uh, fails another death save in which Ashen runs up and gives a healing potion to him. Ashen falls as he's nearly, or uh, sorry, Ashen falls as he lo loses his elemental form and now he gains two points of exhaustion. The party is gassed and out of literally everything they have. Ladna wakes up in this moment. She's confused, uh, but as she sits there and realizes she didn't want to, to be piloted around like that. 
Imogen hugs her and says they need to get her out of or out of her. Uh, Lana can still feel the thrums of Delilah inside her. Dorian pulls out the gem and says that it's not their choice to make. Maybe they should use it. Burn casts identify on the gem, and uh, Chetney pulls out the uh, the scale cloak that they found earlier, and they find and they pull out the soul anchor to all be identified as well. Fern can see that this gem is a piece of Ruidian glass. It's kind of like an arcane battery, meaning it's used to power something or regain spell slots. It has nine spell slots in it. She then casts it again on the scale cloak. It is a plus two, uh, plus two to your AC. Wearers become resistant to poison, and the armor melds to the skin of the wearer, so it can be worn underneath clothes. Uh, she casts it again on the soul anchor, and she sees that the dark runes on the gem of this one are powerful enough to bind a grand demon to it and that these sort of gems are made to house powerful beings one of them being thordak in previous campaigns before he came out and started wrecking havoc they ask essek about soul anchors and he says that they are, are costly and they take time uh the magic of using them is what very well protected imogen asks how fast they can bind something to it and essek says that it's actually a long ritual Imogen wants to bind Ludinus to it, and Essex says that uh, he needs to be in the proximity of it to happen. Ash and Orm are both thinking to use it on something else, on Delilah. Dorian says that Lana and Delilah have caused a lot of problems for them lately. Imogen says that's why they need to deal with her right now. Essex asks why they haven't exercised the creature, and the party explain that they've tried, but it doesn't work. Delilah doesn't want to go. Essex says that uh, there are ways to bind and harness power, the soul anchor is Aorian, so it's a little different than normal. He might be able to change the runes on it and make it so that they can still use Delilah's power without her having control. This excites the party, but he needs to get back to his lab uh, and ask if they are done here. The party wants to rest up, and Essex says that leaving here isn't as bad as getting here, and he pulls out his book, and he takes out a piece of chalk and begins to draw a teleportation circle on the ground, without finishing it informing them that they'll only have a few seconds to go through it. Ashen walks over to the metal dorm of the, uh, the metal dome in the center of the room where uh, Ludinus pulled that orb from that showed them the vision. He places a piece of FCG on it and says, "Welcome home, buddy." And then he goes back to the rest of them. Breas is confused by that and says, "Good luck to the rest of them." Chetney asks where he's going, and Breas says that he's going after Ludinus to kill him. Fern says he can't do it alone, and Breas says that he didn't go down three times in that combat. He can probably do it alone. Chetney says uh, they found him in a broom closet and says that dire circumstances make good allies. The party are split on trusting him right now because they don't know him too well. Fern wants to know more about him. Uh, she asks what he thought about the vision. He thinks the prime deities are children who don't deserve the power they have. Ashton says that uh, they should leave and they'll have a few rounds of what the fuck is up with that when they get to wherever they're going. Braeus goes up to the symbol of Asmodeus that he painted on the wall and asks if he should go with them. He closes his eyes and waits and gets no verbal response, but he looks at the drips of ichor on the wall, and there are eight drips going down that become one. He thinks that that's a big party, but it'll have to do. They all teleport to, Ac to Essex Place, and Liam actually describes the location. It's a messy place within Rexentrum. It's a well-crafted home, but not too big. It's big enough for guests, and it's close to the school that Bren became Caleb and where Caleb now teaches. There's a laboratory, and in the corner is a place dedicated to opening the tower. That amazing place known as the tower. There are mementos of their travels and their friends, books everywhere in piles, and some are left open. Essex says to ignore the mess and moves them out of the laboratory into a more comfortable space. Essex looks to Ladna and asks if she's alright, and she says no. He says that it's good to acknowledge the trauma, and sometimes you can't really see your potential until the worst people have taken advantage of you. He tells her not to blame herself and that he'll work on this all he can. There are no promises, but he'll do what he can. Lana asks if Delilah will become her puppet, and Essek asks if she needs her to survive. Lana says that she guesses, but or she guesses not, but she's scared of what she might lose, especially with this upcoming fight. Essek says that he'll uh, see if he can make her Lana's puppet after all. He tells Imogen to get her some tea, and Essek asks how long. Uh, it'll take for her to come back. Lana thinks that it's up uh, up to her. Essex says that he needs to hurry then. Uh, he puts on a more comfortable robe and then goes inside the lab. Uh, they all take a seat in the 
living room, I guess. Imogen asks uh, who drew all of these dicks on the walls. It was her. It was her. Uh, Lana apologizes for what happened and Orm sits next to her. Orm apologizes for not being able to uh, help her out with everything that's been going on. Lana says that in the darkness she actually had a thought, hoping that Seedling would be the weapon to, to cut her down if worse came to worse. Orm says that he doesn't want that. Uh, Lana says that she doesn't either, but he has the ability to do what's right. Orm says that a lot of his choices uh, haven't panned out in the past. And Lana says that she doesn't know if Dorian will ever trust her again. Dorian says uh, she's not that bad. She'd rather kill a god than her. Brace pulls Fern aside and tells her that she fought bravely. He says what he saw frightened him seeing how much he agreed with lewdness. No matter what happens, someone will uh, become more powerful. They need to figure out uh, who to give that power to. And asks uh, if the party is capable of making that choice. Fern guesses uh, that that's actually true. And Fern says yes, that her friends are going to be capable of making that choice. They're good people and she loves them. Uh, she says that the relatable part for her was watching the gods and seeing that they are a family. Breas asks if he can heal her as she took a bit of damage in the fight, and she says yes, and he heals her with lay on hands. Imogen then passes out cookies to the rest of them. They all notice the dicks on the wall, and there are a lot of dicks on the wall, just all over the place, drawn everywhere. Some of them are carved into the wood. Uh, Orm says it'll be best for them to rest up for a day, and he looks around for portraits. There are a few images of landscape pieces, some of Rexentrum, some of a little farmhouse that seem to be painted from memory, so it's a bit phasey, and there are also a bunch of Jester sketches. Jester originals, you know. Uh, there's one that's kept on the stone wall in the laboratory. It's of Essek and Caleb. Orm says that he knows the man in the painting to Essek, and the party explain how they met Caleb and Bo at the Malleus Key. Orm asks if they are all right, and Essex says, as far as he can tell they are, the last time they talked was a week ago. He checks in, but he has to use his time properly. Essex says that he found the ritual that he needs and asks if anyone has any arcane knowledge. Most of the party at this moment back away. Chetney says that uh, if he needs anyone who, uh, whose specialty is blood, he's the guy. Essex says Delilah is bound to Laudna's flesh and blood and notes Chetney's expertise. At this moment, the party realizes that Brace doesn't know their names. The names that he knows them by are Cheddars, Delilah, Dorian, Fern. He calls Imogen Lautna. He calls Orem Oprah. And he calls Ashen Ash. Interesting names. This is a Terry and Darrington moment all over again. He says that his name is Braeus Doomseed. And they ask about his last name. He says it was bestowed upon him by his oath. Essex says that, or sorry, he says that Essex had a cool trick like turning into a goat and throwing a bead that did absolutely nothing. Essex says that he's just a hobbyist and taps on Brayus' shoulder. Brayus tries to move, but his armor won't move at all. In the night of Rexentrum, the party get ready to rest up and get ready to make a ritual that may change Laudan's life forever. This is where the session ends. So there you have it, episode 102 of Camping 3 of Critical Role. I very much enjoyed this. I, I love being back with the main cast. It's, it's fun to have little side stories, but I really did miss seeing the main cast and the Bell's Hells like... I'm super invested in their story, obviously. So seeing seeing this episode, I like this episode a lot because we come back, we see that the party are sort of split on what they think to do with everything that's going on. As we've kind of known the entire campaign, they've like this group is sort of half and half on if they like the god or and if they don't. So that was kind of expected. And I like that they're they're definitely leaning towards like, no, Ludinus, you're an asshole, which is nice. I would prefer that personally, especially because of all the shit that Ludinus has done over the entirety of the campaign. I was a little worried that some of them might join him, but luckily they didn't. So as of right now, that's not happening. I do like the prospect of Essek being able to sort of remove Delilah from Ladna and like put a necklace around her that's got like the trapped soul of of lot of delilah which is kind of cool because it reminds me of some stuff that was in downfall like with slitch inside the little gem like that's kind of what it reminds me of so that's kind of cool but overall i very much enjoyed this episode i thought the combat was fun i very much liked the sort of conversation they all had because everyone was kind of speaking the truth a little bit like even lewdness with his twisted truth still had like you know there was truth in it with what he was saying so it didn't make me feel like if they did go with him it wouldn't have felt wrong if that makes sense it would have been wrong but it didn't it wouldn't have felt totally 
totally wrong if that makes sense. But anyway, that has been episode 102 of Camping Through of Critical Role. I will see you guys on Tuesday for whatever video I make next. And until then, peace.